have the dates open. Uh, so. Alright, we are ready to start. Uh, this is uh, the last week of classes, so you guys will be happy not to have any classes with me. But we're going to have uh, a recitation last class uh, to discuss homework, what is it, 6 on Monday, not on a Friday, at the regular time. Okay? Uh, so that way it will feel like another class, but it will be a recitation. Uh, I was reminded. And I'm going to correct it that the actual days for the project presentations are Thursday, December 7th, and Friday, December 8th. You remember I kept moving things because they told me they cannot find the room? Uh, since they never found any room or they didn't care to find any room, we're going to go back to the original dates. So we finish by 7th and 8th. Don't look at me like that because they, they told me the next week it's illegal to have anything because it's an exams week. The following week, uh, you are in Malaysia, I don't know, somewhere. So it's going to be 7th and 8th. Okay? And uh, if it is necessary, we're going to do it one person at a time in my office with a video camera. But it's going to happen. Basically, I'm not going to cancel this because they cannot find the room. I find that it uh, sort of a little bit aggravating having to ask 10 times. And I can, I can go to electrical engineering and ask somebody else, and they will immediately find me a room. But you know, certain things are slow in certain places. And I'm on tape, uh, so one day maybe uh, somebody will listen to those tapes. OK, so 7th and 8th, which means everything, uh, your report, your presentation, the original one, the original files are due basically by Wednesday, uh, November 6th on, uh, let's make it 5 p.m. because I'm going to have to post them, right? So I'm going to need some time. Okay? So I'm going to update all this information on the website. Uh, so projects are going to be on 7th and 8th. And uh, uh, where exactly? In the worst case, you remember there is a basement in my house. Um, the old alternative is in my office. Um, and who knows? Uh, maybe miracles will happen before that. Okay. Um, all right. So. Um, what I was hoping is on, uh, on uh, Wednesday to do some review of the class and basically use, if possible, two slides from every lecture uh, so we can summarize different things that we did and remind you uh, of the things you're supposed to have learned. Okay? So now um, I know we started talking about Kerbal PCA on uh, last week. Uh, and uh, in some sense, we were a little bit ahead of ourselves because I don't believe I have discussed too much about or anything about kernel methods. Okay? And uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of uh, give you a little bit more background on kernel methods, uh, starting with a uh, simple regression problem we did early on. And uh, I do hope I, uh, to get some time so we can do a little bit of Gaussian processes in a very elementary fashion. And, uh, uh, you know, both in the context of regression and classification. If I don't finish this part, uh, maybe we can start on Wednesday by discussing this. Okay. So, um, you, know, uh, you know, we did, uh, we worked on, uh, so we worked on uh, regression problems. Um, in a least square sense, regularized least squares, Bayesian setting, and effectively we built a regression function that depended on uh, some uh, uh, parameters W. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we used a basis uh, in, uh, in the x coordinates. Uh, 
Okay, so that was sort of a parametric model. And what we did is, uh, let's say in the Bayesian way, we built the posterior of W given uh, uh, our training data. The notation actually we used, this is Foros Bishop notation. X bold is the input X locations and T bar is the response with noise at the corresponding X locations. So this bold X bold T. So this is the training data set for uh, regression. So we computed this posterior. And once you compute the posterior, basically we got rid of the training data because we never had to use them again. Okay? So today, we're going sort of to discuss alternative methods where we actually um, reverse the data. Okay? So we don't get rid of anything. And there may be cases where keeping the data is beneficial. But we haven't done that up to now in, uh, in our Bayesian analysis. All right. So um, I'll give you an example of uh, something we already discussed, I believe. Somewhere, uh, I don't remember now, in which context were we talking about uh, nearest neighbors? Just before PCA, maybe? Uh, you know, when we were talking about model reduction, I said, you know, you put data in different clusters, and then you find what cluster you belong and you take the center of that cluster as uh, being your reduced representation of your point. So effectively, when you do this uh, nearest neighbors uh, classification techniques, you have to keep your data set, right? Uh, or, you know, there are different versions, but in principle, you have to keep your data sets, OK? And similarly, when you build these uh, uh, density models, uh, you have to keep the training data, data set. And as we will see, you actually go on the top of it and you put some, uh, some uh, kernel functions of, uh, on the top of each training point, like Gaussians or something like that. OK, but we have to see formally how this sort of analysis comes in the picture. So um, I am going to tell you basically the way we're going to do this uh, is going to lead to what is called uh, kernel methods. And I sort of I gave you some idea when we discussed kernel PCA uh, what this implies, right? So kernel methods means uh, we are going somehow to write all our equations in terms of this uh, uh, inner product between x and x prime using these future functions phi that you see here. All right, somehow we're going to write everything uh, in terms of this kernel function. Uh, and we're going to do it in a way that uh, doesn't introduce this function phi of x to start with. OK? So I'm writing here what the definition of a kernel function would be like, right? It looks like an inner product that we take the kernel uh, x comma x is really the inner product, but in future space. So we're going to try to write equations, let's say, for regression in terms of kernels. But we're going to start with kernels directly, rather than with basis functions, and then forcing it to take this kernel form. So that way we will see that these kernel methods are very powerful. So um, a linear kernel looks like this, all right? And I'm going to tell you something. I, I think I referred to it on, uh, on the last lecture. Uh, the famous kernel trick. If somehow you have any sort of model, regression, classification, whatever, where you get inner products that look of this form, then you can actually generalize this. And instead of having a linear kernel, all right? So you notice here, um, you have x and x prime directly. So you can take this and transform it to this problem using this kernel trick. So instead of having x transpose x prime, you can put phi transpose phi, all right? Where phi is any nonlinear function of x. And everything will still be valid. So you can take, let's say, a linear model of regression and make it a nonlinear model of regression. You can take some classification problem that you know it's linear and you can transform it to a nonlinear problem by taking this inner product and transforming it to an inner product that looks like that, which means by introducing any sort of nonlinear kernel, uh, you know, and we will see examples of that. So the kernel trick, if you have an algorithm formulated such that x enters only in the form of scalar products, like here, then you can replace the scalar product with some other choice of kernel. Okay? So instead of having x and x prime, 
you map this to some future space, but actually you do that without introducing free explicitly, but doing uh, by introducing some nonlinear kernel uh, that generalizes the extraspose expression. So here are some examples of uh, kernels. So uh, generally speaking, um, looks like that. Um, it's symmetric, okay? Uh, we already discussed the linear kernel. This is a stationary kernel that depends only on the distance between point X and X prime. Uh, this is a homogeneous kernel. Uh, well, here it depends on the distance, but as a vector, here it depends on the distance as a magnitude. This uh, will lead to what you will see, uh, what we call uh, regular basis functions. So the distance between X and X prime, okay? So stationary kernels, homogeneous kernels. Um, and um, with this kernel trick, you can apply it to different type of things. And one of the things we discussed in like three minutes was uh, taking PCA, but doing PCA in future space. Uh, and that leads to what's called kernel PCA methods. Actually, this whole book, uh, if you're interested, okay, um, it's a thousand pages book actually on uh, uh, everything on machine learning with kernel methods. Okay, so let's see how kernels come in the context of uh, simple regression. So this will be sort of a good review of uh, regression problems. And we're not even going to be Bayesian. We're going to take uh, a regularized least squares type of problem. So where uh, our regression function is W transpose phi of x, OK? Uh, our training data is xn tn. So we want to minimize this error. We want to find W that minimizes this uh, uh, error. And we also have regularized this. So in some sense, you know, if you do a map estimate, you do get uh, uh, a point estimate for W that uh, minimizes this, okay? So uh, let's see how we can uh, come up with um, uh, what's called the dual representation of this problem. Uh, and there are lots of new concepts that are going to come to play a role here. So take the derivative of this with respect to W, all right? Uh, will you agree with me? And so you set the derivative of this equal to zero. You will agree that you get something that looks like that. So we're going to get uh, lambda w from here, right? Um, you put on the other side minus. And this is square, so it will give you uh, this times the derivative with respect to W, which is phi of xn. So uh, here's the trick. I am going to call this parenthesis uh, an, OK? Just some scalar, OK? Uh, notice that the index n here, this is very important, is over the data point, OK? So the weight W right, that uh, minimize this objective function can be written as a linear combination of these future functions phi calculated at the data points uh, xn, okay? And you can write this in, um, in a matrix form as phi transpose A, where phi is the design matrix. Uh, we introduced this before, right? The design matrix basically every row corresponds to one data point, uh, and it is basically uh, these vectors here on each row. So on the first row you have phi of x1 as a row vector, phi of x2, etc. Uh, and so this is phi transpose A. Okay? So when I define this, uh, we are looking coefficient as an. It doesn't really matter how it looks like. The idea here is that the optimal w, it's a linear combination of phi computed at the, at the data points. Right? So you notice here, uh, I want to get rid of W, and somehow I want to keep the data points. So the way I'm going to do this is by substituting W as phi transpose A. All right, so this is the original problem, okay? And we said we will uh, substitute uh, W to be phi transpose A. So uh, what I do is I go to this equation on the top, okay? And I put uh, W transpose would be A transpose phi. Etc. Etc. If you do like this, 
uh, and then with simplifying the algebra you get this nice problem and here is by the way I give you explicitly uh, the design matrix field looking like that okay um, I am just telling you what uh, the derivations here use P transpose P being this P transpose uh, tau being this all right so this is what I get you know that there is no W there so the questions that we used to play when we do when we did regression before have been disappearing from the picture and now instead we have this A okay uh, and our problem looks like that okay so I am doing the following definition I'm going to introduce this uh, matrix K of size n by n that is basically the inner product of uh, fiat xn with fiat xn this is where the kernel comes right so I'm going to uh, introduce and define a new matrix K that is this inner product okay that's our kernel all right and you can see uh, from the equations I had before and also you can see it here this matrix K is nothing else but phi times phi transpose okay uh, and it's important is of size n by n so uh, this phi phi transpose is 1k another k there so j of a is written like that all right and this is uh, what's called the real representation of um, uh, our regression problem there is no w everything is written in terms of a but also notice very importantly everything is written in terms of k so basically uh, you know what to reach this point I don't really need the basis functions anymore you know why because if instead of uh, in defining k to be this I can go and arbitrarily say use this kernel and then I have this alright so the idea here is that's why is this called the dual formulation is I can get rid of this concept of having this basis functions uh, phi of xn alright and I can start directly with this kernel okay that will define this ground matrix k okay and uh, then I have this representation that we see uh, down there okay so if you uh, set the derivatives of this uh, with respect to a equal to zero you get basically your regularized uh, estimate for a so a is k plus lambda times i inverse times your training data point t so k is again defined completely in terms of the, the kernel matrix um, um, okay and, and actually you can immediately say that to do predictions with this model we don't need the basis function so let's see that so if this was our uh, our regression function that we started with right so if somebody tells you give me the response the y at the point x this was the definition of the regression function w transpose p of x so W transpose, uh, you know what uh, W was uh, uh, phi transpose A, right? So W transpose A transpose phi. Uh, this is scalar. So I can write this as this transpose times this transpose times A, okay? Uh, and phi transpose, capital phi transpose, you know what it is? Look at this. Miracles. You remember the matrix P transpose was P at X1, P at X2, P at X1. So P transpose, capital P transpose, is uh, this row vector that you see here, which is completely defined also in terms of kernels. Right? But now, notice we want to do predictions of the location X. The kernel that comes in uh, this equation here, uh, this kernel vector is the kernel value x1 comma x x1 is a training point x is where I want to do predictions then x2 comma x x10 comma x so basically to do predictions uh, this is the form that is completely defined in terms of kernel functions k is a kernel this vector k is defined in terms of kernels this is basically involves the data points so it's the kernel uh, sort of distances between the training data sets and this is the distance sort of a measure of the distance between the point where you want to do predictions and the training data x1 to xn 
Okay? So this formulation, again, uh, you can take all the equations, rewrite them, get rid of anything that has two in it, and uh, start directly in, in uh, terms of this uh, kernel K. So you introduce this, can make it anything you want to, all right? And here is a way to do regression. So you compute the say like that from your training data. This matrix is completely defined in terms of uh, kernel values. And then your predictions is also in terms of kernels. No W, all right? No basis functions. Now, uh, can you tell me is this good or bad? Basically, the, this is n by n. Uh, what was the matrices that we had to invert when uh, uh, we did uh, regression with basis functions? So in our regression problem, right, to find, let's say, the map estimate for W, there was a matrix that, that we had to invert. How big was that matrix? What was the finding in the matrices we had to invert when we did regression and point estimates? It was n by n or what? So it was the dimension of the number of basis functions we were using in the model or the number of w's. All right? So uh, if it happens, of course, that n is way bigger than the number of basis functions you were using for this problem, obviously you will be in uh, trouble. Uh, so. Uh, if n is small, of course, this is much uh, more uh, efficient way of doing this. But right now, we're not doing this simply because uh, uh, this may be more useful as a regression approach than uh, what we did before. We do this because now uh, there is no concept of basis function, right? There are kernels. And uh, you can start thinking about uh, if you start directly with a kernel function, uh, you know, theoretically, how many basis functions you have introduced in your problem? So now, if you say, I'm going to introduce a, a kernel between two points um, that is uh, a regular basis function, I mean, a regular kernel that uh, is defined in terms of the uh, regular distance between xn and xn, how many basis functions that implies? I mean, before we had n basis functions, right? You can see here, you know, uh, well, these vectors are uh, of order n. If I start with a kernel, no basis functions at all. If I want to put some equivalence between the two things, how many basis functions a kernel implies? How much? n squared? No. In principle, infinite. Okay, because now we have become completely non-parametric. We work in function spaces. Okay, so that's the idea here. That's why we're doing it. Okay. All right. By the way, I'm not going to go through this. is in the slides. It's a nice exercise. If you try to find the dual of the dual representation, you will go back to the original. Uh, uh, basis function formulation, uh, the mathematics are a little bit tricky, but uh, you know we're not interested in that. Okay, so let's say uh, I'm going to start with some kernels that are defined uh, from basis functions, so you can get some sense on how they look like. All right. So the, uh, what I want you to think is when you have a kernel between uh, two points x and x prime, right? Effectively, they tell you how much. Uh, your output, if you like, here, your uh, two variables are related to each other between two points x and x prime. Okay? And that's why you anticipate that this thing goes down basically uh, to zero uh, faster or slower depending on what kernel you use. So if the kernels that use a polynomial, all right, so this is uh, 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 a plot, so you, here you pick up one of the kernel locations, x prime. And then you plot this as a function of x, it looks like that. Um, if you use Gaussian basis functions, all right? So these are basis functions at different uh, locations, all Gaussians. Uh, the uh, kernel basically uh, function is also uh, Gaussian, okay? It looks like that. Uh, 
if you take these functions to be sigmoidal uh, at different locations, so the center basically is zero, the, you know, uh, this line called temperature changes, uh, you know, varies. So basically you get uh, uh, a curve that looks like that. Uh, and uh, let me give you some specific examples uh, uh, and the algebra that goes with it. So if you have, let's say, uh, if you operate in two dimensions and you have two vector sections Z, an easy way to uh, think of cameras would be in terms of inner products, but you know, generally this is difficult to, to work it in high dimensions, but let's say X and Z are in 2D, um, and uh, somebody tells you here's a kernel. Right, so you would say is this sort of uh, a correct kernel, and a correct kernel in principle would mean that we need to write this as an inner product of two future vectors of x and z, and the way to do this is by defining you know if you substitute x to be x1, x2, z, z1, z2, you take this square, all right, and you try to write it as the inner product of uh, phi of x and phi of z. Basically, you realize that phi of x has to look like that. Okay? But actually, nobody does this, okay? So you don't really have to put it in a form like that. And the only thing uh, to get a valid kernel is to check that uh, these values for, of k, uh, m, n, for every xn and xm, uh, this is a semi-definite, basically, matrix, okay? So it has to be greater or equal to zero, regardless of the values of x, n, and xn. Okay, um, this is what's called kernel engineering, and it sounds uh, sort of uh, um, an irrelevant topic, but it's an extremely active uh, area of research, okay? Uh, basically, all of these equations tell you, if you start with some value kernels K1 and K2, all of this, uh, with these constraints on the bottom, are also value kernels, okay? So, for example, um, if you multiply a valid kernel with a constant C that is positive, that's a valid kernel. Uh, if, you, if Q is a polynomial, right, with positive coefficients, and uh, instead of uh, X inside the polynomial you go and you put the kernel values, that's a valid kernel. If you add kernels, it's a valid kernel. Uh, notice here the kernel uh, trick effectively. If K3 is a kernel, and instead of x and x prime, you put some future function of x and x prime, you get a value kernel. Uh, if uh, f is an arbitrary function, through and post multiplying uh, a value kernel with f, f of x and f of x prime is a value kernel, et cetera, et cetera. So in principle, why is this important? Uh, because a kernel will capture lots of the physics of your problem, will capture how things are correlated in your problem. So the right choice here, all right, uh, may make uh, the solution of your problem more accurate than uh, uh, the wrong choice. And in principle, if you can pose this uh, in a systematic way, let's say, can you imagine if you do, uh, you know, regression with kernel methods, and you pose the problem as a model selection where you in addition to everything else, you identify the, the optimal kernel for your problem. All right? So usually nobody does this because it's a very difficult problem. So what they do is they use one of these kernels with a lot of parameters, and then they try to use, uh, um, you know, evidence or so, sort of approximation to find those parameters. And, and I will show you hopefully uh, uh, today on how to do this. Okay, I have some examples on how to prove these equations before. We don't need it. Um, so, for example, uh, here is uh, the Gaussian kernel, all right? Uh, this corresponds to uh, regular basis functions. So if you uh, expand this Euclidean distance square, uh, you will get x transpose x, x prime, transpose x prime, minus 2x transpose x prime. So actually, you can uh, uh, write this uh, to convince yourself that actually it's a valid kernel as this function f of x, this function f of x prime, and then you have the exponential of x transpose x prime over sigma square, okay? And uh, uh, why we need these equations before, you notice, 
if this is a valid kernel, then this is a valid kernel. All right? So uh, if this is a valid kernel, then obviously this will be a valid kernel, this will be a valid kernel, but we have to prove that this is a valid kernel. So uh, why is this a valid kernel? Can you tell me? I mean, how do you conclude that this is a valid kernel? But uh, exponential in the middle. Is x transpose x prime a valid kernel? Yes. Um, and uh, if you have an exponential of that, let's see if there was any ex equation that says exponential. I don't see that, but you know what I see? Uh, I see a polynomial, or there is also x power. Okay, there it is. All right? So there is an exponential, but I was looking here, right? A polynomial with uh, the coefficients being non negative. So if you can think of the exponential power this expansion, uh, that does it as well. Okay? Uh, so when, uh, when you look at this, right, uh, how many, uh, how many, you know, in future space, if you want to write this in terms of functions per effects, can you see that this kernel in the middle by itself has infinite base functions? Right? This thing in the middle has infinite basis functions because, you know, if you approximate this with Taylor series expansion, you will get uh, an infinite set of uh, uh, terms corresponding to an infinite set of uh, these three functions. But we don't need them, right? We just need to be sure when we start with something that it is a valid kernel and this shows that it is a valid kernel. By the way, if you want to push things further, uh, so this is the, the Gaussian kernel, right? It looks uh, we, we prove that it works, but you know what else I can do? I can take this inner product in the Euclidean coordinates and plug in instead of x transpose x any other kernel. This is a good, a good k, all right? All right, it's different from that. So I can put here another kernel, uh, a nonlinear kernel, and then I have exponential of this nonlinear kernels. That's also a valid kernel. Okay, so. The kernel trick tells me every time you see uh, an inner product like that, you can transform x using uh, any future functions, which in principle means I can plug in any other kernel here, uh, k of x, x, k of x prime, x prime, etc. This k is different from that k, right? So this is our original Gaussian kernel, and now I plug in anything else, and this looks like a Gaussian kernel, but actually it's not your classical Euclidean Gaussian kernel because this can be in principle, anything you want. All right. Uh, you can do this, by the way, probabilistically speaking. Uh, so if you talk about a generative model, uh, I can define a valid kernel that is uh, the probability of x times the probability of x prime. Okay? Uh, so in some sense, you know, this doesn't capture correlations, but you know, uh, this is significant when uh, both p of x and p of x prime are significant. So. Um, uh, if one is very big and another one is very small, this will have a smaller value. Um, okay, so um, this is in the context of latent variables. You, know, uh, you guys read it, so I don't need to go through this. Uh, a very famous kernel, uh, and uh, it comes often actually, if you are interested in uh, research, is uh, what's called the Fisher kernel. Okay, so. Um, Everyone we were talking about uh, uh, prior models, right? We had introduced this Fisher score, which is the derivative with respect to the parameters of a long likelihood model, right? So take this as a definition. You have a likelihood model uh, that for each parameter theta gives you some data x. Uh, so take the log of that, take the gradient with respect to theta. This is what you call, uh, define as the Fisher score, okay? So the Fisher kernel, this is the definition of uh, this special scores evaluated at x and x prime with uh, the special information metrics that we had seen, I think, in the second or third uh, lecture in the middle there. And the special information metrics is nothing else but the expectation with respect to the uh, distribution of x of g, g transport. All right, so two definitions there, okay? Uh, the Fisher score. Uh, the kernel in terms of the Fisher scores and the Fisher information metrics, 
and the fish information uh, metrics is given uh, uh, like that. Okay. Um, you may say, you know, what is all this about? But actually, if you check even in the context of a of a Gaussian distribution, uh, if we take parameters new to be the parameter theta that I had in my previous definition. So if you take the log of this and you compute the Fisher score, it comes to be the covariance inverse x minus mu. All right? And then you take the Fisher information matrix is the expectation of this. So you plug in G as s minus 1, x minus mu. Uh, then x minus mu transpose s minus 1. And then you get this nice expectation which is nothing else but a covariance matrix. So for Gaussians, when theta is, is the mean mu, the Fisher information matrix is S minus 1. And then the Fisher kernel, when you plug in S minus 1 and this, it comes out to be this nice distance. And this distance, uh, I, I, I would like to assume that I use the Mahalanobis distance somewhere uh, early on in the course, but it comes to be sort of a generalization of the Euclidean distance that's called Mahalanobis distance. Okay? Um, so this idea of using this uh, Fisher information matrix is very important when you try to find distances between uh, points in a curved manifold, right? So you can see here in the distance you account for the inverse of the covariance matrix, right? Uh, so the curvature of the manifold comes inside here. This is for a simple case for a Gaussian uh, distribution, but you can think you get way more interesting things when the distribution becomes uh, non-Gaussian. Um, 407, so let me see what uh, um, uh, I have time to tell you. Um, I actually am going to skip this. Uh, skip this. All right. So, so let's go back to the um, regression problem. All right. So you remember on the regression problem, um, uh, you know, we um, I give you some training data x, some training data t, and we try to fit some regression function. Um, in all the methodologies we did, but most importantly, uh, in the Bayesian methodology, we defined the regression function to be the expectation um, uh, of two given x. So if you remember at its location x, we actually computed some Gaussian distribution, then the regression function was the expectation of that. Okay? So this is how we define it. So let's uh, uh, introduce uh, a kernel sort of approach to um, to the uh, regression problem, and I'm going to start uh, by introducing what I call uh, I, I'm going to introduce these functions f, all right, in the joint space of x and t. Okay, so I am going to um, uh, I am going to approximate uh, the uh, joint distribution of x and t as uh, you know, in terms of this component as these functions in this form. Can you get some sense on what this uh, means, basically? What, you know, give me some interpretation of this. Approximately, what does it do? So we, are, we have a lot of uh, training data, Xn, Tn, right? We come up with this uh, function, F can be a Gaussian. So what am I doing here to approximate the joint distribution of X and T? I mean, these points are uh, my training data points. So uh, effectively, what do I do at each training point? Think of that being a Gaussian. So what do you do at each training point? You, you know if you put a Gaussian, and then if you take the response at any arbitrary point x and t to be what? to be the average of these Gaussians at its point. And you may say, well, if I have a Gaussian here and I want to response there, this doesn't make sense here, right? Because this Gaussian is zero down there. Well, yeah, no problem, because uh, the response of x and t depends on the distance of uh, uh, x from xn, t from tn. So if the distance is very big, 
the importance of this function f coming from the point uh, n will be insignificant when I try to do predictions of x. You see that? Okay? So again, uh, this is an approximation, right? I'm just uh, if, if you, of course, have a lot of data points, okay? This will be an accurate approximation. But let's start with this, okay? So we postulate this uh, component density function, can be anything right now. Uh, the key thing is, it's centered at its training point, and I use this to do predictions. So let's see how the, the, uh, the regression function looks like. The regression function is nothing else but the expectation of the response t given x at any x, right? So I write this expectation as uh, t times uh, uh, my, the probability of t given x, dt, all right? So I am writing this as the joint distribution divided by the normalization factor. All right, pay attention here, right? So I'm writing this conditional as the joint divided by the normalization factor. And then what I do is I plug in this approximation. So I have summation on n, uh, integral of two times these functions, all right? And on the bottom, I have basically the same thing, except t. There's no t here. It's just an normalization factor. So this is m here, and this is m. OK? So let me, uh, I'm going to make one assumption. You will see something uh, extremely nice that comes out from this, OK? I'm going to make an assumption uh, that these functions, uh, sort of, I have uh, uh, posed them in a form that uh, they have zero mean, OK? I mean, I can always do this, right? So I pose these functions, uh, f of x and t, so that they have a zero mean. So here's the trick. Before, uh, this is my uh, regression function at the every point x, all right? Uh, comes to be this. So what I'm going to do is that t here, I'm going to subtract tn, and I'm going to add tn. All right, the rest are identical as, as uh, uh, as before. So can you tell me how much is this integral? I have two terms here. What's the integral of t minus tn times this, uh, this f, using this? So the integral of t minus tn times this. t minus tn times this, according to this. How much? Zero. So then I have tn times, all right? Uh, this function f, so th when I do this, by the way, um, the second term involves tn, and then I have an integral, all right? I have an integral uh, in t, all right? So basically I'm going to marginalize in t, so t will disappear. And what I get is, I get, uh, if this was a joint Gaussian, right? I'm going to get only the Gaussian corresponding to x. So I'm going to get, uh, uh, I'm going to get basically this thing with t uh, out of the picture divided by this thing where, uh, again, t has been integrated out. So basically what I get, the response of every location x is this function's g computed at x minus xn divided by the average of all of the functions x uh, that are uh, basically on the top of every data point xn. So effectively this are what I call my kernel here is uh, this functions g at x minus xn divided by the average of all of the functions calculated basically from the contributions from all the training data points. This is sort of a normalization part. So what I want you to remember because this is sort of algebra, the response at every point is actually a weighted average of these kernels, uh, each of them on the top of every training data point. So if you think of any training data point with a Gaussian, right, this is the average of these Gaussians, but what I have done is I don't use each Gaussian alone, I've normalized these Gaussians, all right, so I don't have big contributions in one area, small somewhere else, I normalize them by dividing by this sum that you see. Uh, and I do this in every location x, basically. So this is uh, uh, a very historical application, if you like, of general methods to regression problems. And, um, um, you know, um, 
I don't know if he has any value beyond research, but certainly uh, it gives you uh, an idea on how suddenly we went from uh, uh, based on inference from the weights and the regression model to now keeping the training data points and basically uh, using these kernel approximations to, to do predictions. All right, and, and uh, here is, by the way, um, a nice plot uh, using this uh, Nagaraja Watson model. Okay, it looks like the regression models uh, we did earlier on in, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in regression, but actually the model is completely different. Okay, so um, think about at every point, okay, at every point x, my response is basically this, uh, in the example of the Gaussian kernels, all right, uh, normalized times uh, the, uh, the delta t that I have at that point, okay? So at every point, effectively, all right, there is a Gaussian that belongs there, all right? This is my local kernels, and these are of local extent, all right? So at every data point, all right, I, this is how my canvas look like, okay? Uh, and, um, and then when we want to do predictions, at, let's say we want to do predictions at this point, we're going to take an average, uh, you know, of all the contribution of all of these kernels centered at the training data points, but obviously the kernels that they are very close to where we want to do prediction, we have the most significant uh, contribution. Uh, if you're far away, basically those contributions will be zero. So what you can uh, do this, if you plot this, you know, if you go up every uh, location x and um, uh, you compute your regression function accounting for this uh, kernels at each training data point, you get a plot that looks similar to what we did for Bayesian regression, but actually there's nothing Bayesian on this, okay? So there's nothing really sort of Bayesian. We just use the concept of a regression function, okay? But the results actually look sort of uh, very similar. A nice MATLAB code uh, written by a student uh, in an earlier offering of this uh, type of uh, uh, lecture. Okay. All right, so we are, it's first 17. I have some time now to discuss about uh, uh, Gaussian processes, okay? Generalizing this concept of uh, kernel methods. The discussion will be way too elementary, all right, for the topic, but hopefully you will see that the Gaussian process, there's nothing uh, new there, all right? It's uh, sort of uh, simple generalizations of the things we already have discussed in the course. So before, um, uh, you know, we play with weights, we complete the posterior, and once we have the posterior, we get rid of all the training data and we use the posterior to do predictions. So we have to revisit this. All right, so let me start um, uh, with a regression function that looks like that, okay? And uh, I remind you when we did Bayesian regression, what we did is we put a prior on W, right? That's the whole promise of uh, Bayesian inference. So, uh, so all these uh, coefficients W, they have the same precision alpha, okay? That's the simple model we started. And, uh, and um, uh, this is sort of the starting point for what we have done with Bayesian uh, regression. So I want you to appreciate the following thing. Let's say, um, so this is the prior model, if you like. This is the regression function, this is the prior on W. So let's say you sample some W from this prior model. What do you get when you plug in that uh, W inside the first equation? what the first equation basically gives you when you plug in uh, a realization of W. What do you get? So if I, you know, you know, plug in, you know, I sample some values, let's say in two dimensions, W1 equal 1, W2 equal to 5, and I plug them in there, what is this giving me now? Mathematically, what quantity do I get? Yes? I know, and, and uh, what do we call that? The tensor, the matrix, what is it? Uh, what is that that we get out of this calculation? 
So if we put the specific W, what is this thing there? Mathematically speaking, what type of quantity is that? Huh? It is a well, scalar, if Y scalar, but uh, uh, I see an X there, so how do we call that in calculus? It's a function. So basically, so is the idea, right? This is the, really it's trivial, there's nothing there on this topic, okay? The idea is this prior on W, right? Uh, when you sample from this, every sample then that you get in the context of Y is a function. So basically, this prior on W induces a probability over functions. All right, so the whole idea is, can we somehow get rid of this concept of W and T of X and start directly with the probability over the functions Y of X? Okay? And uh, so if you to say this, basically these are the two equations that you need to keep in mind. Sample of W gives you a function, another sample gives you another function, so you both have uh, a probability over functions. The question is, how do you do this without actually ever introducing W and few things? In principle, you know, kernel methods will actually help us uh, to do this. So let's see how this is going to work. Uh, so if I go back on this regression model, right, um, I can, uh, so let's say we have N, uh, N uh, training data points, right? And uh, so this is the function computed at the training points, okay? Let's not worry about um, uh, noise, um, you know, in the calculation. So y is the function calculated x1, y is the function at xn, all right? So y is uh, my design matrix p times w, all right? This is basically this equation written for all my training uh, data points, okay? So y is y at x1, y at x2, y at x n, two times w. All right. So, um, so we said, um, so n training points, okay, so let's compute uh, what the, uh, uh, you know, w comes with the probability, right? That's uh, the prior model. So if w comes with the probability, so what's the expectation of y? The expectation of y is p times the expectation of w is zero. The covariance of y, you can immediately see, is p times uh, the expectation of w, w transpose, p transpose. And, uh, and uh, this is what the covariance of y comes to be, OK? Uh, the expectation of w, w transpose from here, right, is uh, 1 uh, over alpha because the mean is 0. So you have 1 over alpha times p, p transpose. Can you now guess what uh, the uh, you know, the non-parametric kernel sort of approach to regression will be for this problem. So in other ways, we said this W induces a probability of the functions. How do we see that probability without ever having to bother about W? So look at these two equations and see what we need to describe this uh, multivariate Gaussian uh, that defines Y. Right, you know, by the way, that it is Gaussian, right? So if this is Gaussian, right, and you plug it in, the probability of y will be uh, a Gaussian as well. So what do I get here? The covariance is defined by 50 transpose. Don't bother that the alpha can actually incorporate inside the phi matrix. This is my candle matrix that I had before. Okay. So the idea is, let's forget about uh, W, let's forget about basis functions. How about if I start with this kernel, um, and we forget about this actually as well, right? We start with this kernel, okay? And then I'm going to uh, define, uh, uh, this is over my training point, I'm going to define a distribution of functions, all right? Uh, that uh, the only thing that we need to specify itself is this covariance, this covariance is basically this uh, uh, kernel matrix, this gram matrix uh, uh, K. All right? So the idea is, uh, let's not uh, bother about anything, uh, but introduce this directly. And uh, effectively, that will give me a Gaussian, uh, what's called a Gaussian process. So let me read it carefully. A Gaussian process, the probability distribution of the functions. 
such that, this is very important, the set of the values of yx evaluated at the points x1 to xn jointly have a Gaussian distribution uh, and the rest we don't care. And I remind you, here, where the values of the function evaluated at the training data points x1 to xn, all right, and because when we started w, the prior was a Gaussian, the distribution of yx1 and yx1 together was a multivariate Gaussian uh, versus uh, the definition of a Gaussian process. The idea here is, I do have a distribution over functions, but when I want to evaluate the distribution over functions, I will evaluate it at a set of points, and at the set of those points, the distribution is always a multivariate Gaussian. Right? And those points here, we started with the training points, but you know, as you will see, we will extend this to any points where we can do predictions. So if you take any collection of points, right, the joint distribution of y's at those points is a multivariate Gaussian, and the only thing that I need to describe it is the mean that we take at zero to start with, and the covariance that can be defined uh, directly in terms of an arbitrary curve of uh, k, no basis functions involved, no w's involved, and this is uh, what the Gaussian process is. So, um, so these are uh, samples of uh, how the um, uh, samples from the prior of this function of this Gaussian process, right? Uh, when my kernel is uh, uh, is a Gaussian kernel, these are samples of these functions. This is how they look all over the place, basically, but they are smooth. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, a very uh, typical kernel used for dynamical, multi-scale dynamical problems. Uh, and uh, you can see here the time length scales are much smaller, OK? Uh, and uh, uh, the functions basically have uh, short and long term time scales here that uh, may be beneficial. So, um, all right, so here's what we have to do. We have a model that uh, it's a, a prior model of the functions. Okay? And so what we need to do is now we need to do the full regression problem starting with a prior model. Okay? So here's what I'm going to do. We started with a function y evaluated at some training points yn, right? And we said the joint distribution of these y's is a multivariate Gaussian, but now I have some training data, so I have xn, and I know the corresponding value of the function at the point xn, uh, and that corresponding value differs from the function value by some noise, epsilon n, that we will take it to be Gaussian, okay? So the noise model, all right, so uh, given the function value, the noise, the corresponding noise value is basically a Gaussian with some uh, precision beta, and um, you know, um, we already have discussed about this beta, but let's take the beta is no, okay? Just to, to start with, okay? So, uh, so this is the noise model, this is where the Gaussian process, the prior fits in, right? And, and I have another Gaussian model that tells me what the response is uh, if I knew what the function is, okay? So, Look at the question on um, one of these things, right? When you take uh, uh, this noise model, uh, these two ends, given the y ends are independent, so if I put all of them together at the training data set, this is a multivariate Gaussian, all right? So my response is at all my training points, given y, they are centered around y, and they have noise defined by beta. Nothing fancy, okay? All right. So, uh, I am going to give you two steps, basically. Every calculation you need to know about Gaussian processes, and there's really nothing beyond that, okay? Uh, this is the prior over these functions, right? Uh, and remember, uh, these functions have mean zero, right? They're not a valid Gaussians, okay? And the only thing I, know, I need to know is this curve of K. That's the prior model. By the way, you know, uh, when I write it like that as a, a, a multivariate Gaussian, the idea here, you know, they say, what is the function? Well, what is the function? Well, the idea is, 
that I'm going to evaluate this function at the finite number of points, and then the general distribution at all of these points, right, the P of Y, is this Gaussian. All right? Uh, but basically, it works like uh, we're looking at some number of points, but if you, if you want to make this the function explicit, think of the number of points that define this is infinite. Okay? But right now, I have the training data set to start with, all right? And at the training data set, uh, this, uh, this probability of the rise there is given by this prior one. All right? Um, now, uh, let's see how the likelihood looks like. All right? The likelihood model, the probability of my observations T, is the noise model, just, you know, the product rule. All right? So this is the probability of T given Y times P of Y by Y. So what type of flow distribution is this, P of T given Y? You know there is a Gaussian with uh, this noise here, all right? Okay? Uh, and what is P of Y? Is, uh, this is my prior model, all right? Defined in terms of this uh, uh, covariance matrix K. So, uh, if this is Gaussian, and this is Gaussian, can you marginalize and come up with uh, the probability of the observations? Do you remember how we will do this? Directly looking at formulas that we have seen in the class before? Yes? All right, so if you can do this, then this comes to be a Gaussian, and this Gaussian has a, a mean zero and a covariance, k plus beta minus one i, i, okay? So, to define basically the likelihood of your, uh, you know, uh, of your uh, observations, that is a Gaussian, and this is the covariance, and effectively you can appreciate that any unknown parameters, uh, you will have to maximize the log likelihood that you see here, all right? So if you want to compute, let's say, the noise beta or any parameters inside the kernel, you have to maximize the log likelihood of this. Okay, so we don't need this. So here is uh, 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 a kernel uh, that uh, you can use with a number of parameters. Uh, this is your uh, uh, Gaussian radial uh, function like uh, kernel, the standard one. And you notice I put two unknown parameters, theta 0, theta 1. You can plug in a, a constant term here, okay? You can put a linear kernel. You can do anything you want to. You can put periodic kernels, whatever fits in. Uh, to your particular problem. Uh, these are different examples of uh, different kernels. So these are basically uh, using different values. Uh, and you can see uh, the type of functions actually you can uh, get. This is sort of, uh, now it becomes sort of uh, um, uh, dangerously complicated because, you know, do we expect this type of functions that look very smooth? Do we expect this type of functions? All right, what do you expect in your problem? So that can make a big difference. Ideally, if you're going to use this kernel, ideally, you will uh, let your data speak out and select what are the right parameters that explain the observations you have. Okay? And uh, hopefully we will, uh, uh, if we have time, we will do this a little bit today. Okay? So, um, all right. So, uh, we, uh, so we, let's say we have uh, a number of uh, training data. So I give you the x, uh, I give you the two values, all right? Uh, and then somehow you train the system and you find all the known parameters such as uh, the status. Okay, and I'm going to come back to this by maximizing the, the uh, likelihood. Uh, the question is now, how do we do predictions? I mean, I do know Okay, that at, if I take any point x, I have a multivariate Gaussian. Okay, how do we do predictions basically to a point x n plus one that was not part of my training data point? Here is the whole uh, uh, trivial approach to Gaussian processes. So we had uh, when we train the system, we have locations x one, x two, x n. Right now, uh, I. Uh, I'm going to enhance the vector of x locations to x1, x2, xn, 
and x n plus 1, where I want to predict the probability of t n plus 1. I don't know t n plus 1, but I say I want to do predictions at the new point x n plus 1. And the idea is, do I have a prior model for all the observations, including the ones I already I have data for, plus the one that I want to predict? Do you know what this probability is? And the answer is this. What is that? What is that? Because if I take the joint probability, right, of my function response, or my noise function response, which is this t, what type of distribution do I have? It's a matter of higher Gaussian. That's what the Gaussian process is. At any locations I select, if I put all of the observations together, I get a Gaussian. By definition, that's what the Gaussian process, right? The, the reason here is, I know to run to 10, I want to predict 10 plus 1, and when I write this model here, this is my symmetrix, and the symmetrix, you remember? Uh, where's my symmetrix? This is my symmetrix. It's k plus beta minus 1i. This is my kernel matrix. Involves all the time and data points, but also it involves the point x n plus 1, where I want to do predictions. Okay? So, I know t1 to tn, I want to predict tn plus 1. We will be able to solve this problem if you know, if this is a multivariate Gaussian, and you know t1 to tn, and I want you to predict tn plus 1, can you do that? What type of calculation do you have to do to this multivariate Gaussian to predict tn plus 1? The what? <laughs> Sort of, but um, at the end of the day, computer square in order to compute what from here? You need the conditional of tn plus 1 given t1 to tn. So if I have a multivariate Gaussian, right, and I split it in two parts, or what I know and what I don't know, I can find the conditional. Correct? And that conditional, um, I am going to give you the answer. Well, this is what I did, right? I split this in uh, the components that I know. Uh, all right, and the things I don't know, in this vector k, you know what it is? Uh, by looking at uh, this uh, symmetrix, it is the kernel matrix uh, that accounts for the distances between the point xn plus 1 and the training points x1 to xn. Okay? So if somebody tells you uh, terminal tn plus 1 and ball tn plus 1 given t1 to tn, Basically, what you need to do is you need to find the conditional from that, and here is the answer to that, okay? Uh, this I, I remind you the formulas. So here is what the answer is. What is the answer of that? Is it written somewhere? Yes. Uh, no, it is not written. What is the answer? Yes. So, uh, the, it comes to be Gaussian, obviously, right? This is what we want to compute. It comes to be Gaussian, and the name of the Gaussian, it comes out to be... Uh, this vector k that accounts for the distance of your point xn plus 1 from x1 from x2 to xn. This is my covariance matrix um, in my prior uh, model uh, computed over the end date, uh, training data points. So this is completely defined in terms of kernels. And this are my observation data, uh, training data. Okay? So this is what the mean comes, right? And if you have it actually. Uh, in a nice form, you can see that this mean at the location x n plus 1 uh, is nothing else but uh, an interpolation from this kind of values from all the training data points but computed at x n plus 1. Okay? Nice. And then the uh, standard deviation at x n plus 1, uh, the variance basically it is given uh, by this constant x, I mean c, right, minus k transpose c n minus 1 times k. And you put the idea again, right? Gaussian process means any locations you take for the values of the function, you get a multivariate Gaussian. So you know the function value at n points, right? That's your training points. And now we want to do a calculation at the n plus 1 point, if you like. So what you do, the starting point is you say, if I take x1 to xn and xn plus 1 still will get a Gaussian when it comes to the response of the function. I know the values of this uh, multivariate Gaussian of the first 10 points because these are my training points. 
then by computing the conditional, you get this, a new Gaussian that gives you the, the mean, the mean response, and it gives you uh, uh, it gives you the variance that looks like that. You may ask now, are these values very different from, let's say if I train my system with uh, the standard way with W, where I put the Gaussian prior on W, are these results actually giving me answers that they are very different or the same? What do you think? Remember when I started to define the Gaussian process, so let's put a prior on W that induces a prior over functions. So if I do all of this in terms of the kernels eventually, versus the other way, what do you think? Do I get different results? Is this two different things? What are they? Yeah. I mean, I assume that this kernel is defined in terms of the basis functions in future space that I had on what we did long ago. Do you think I will get the same answers? Yes. We better get the same answers. So then we may say, then what's the purpose of doing all of this? One of the purpose here is that this kind of function now does not have to be defined in terms of basis functions, can be anything. And actually it can be the optimal kernel that you, you know, massage all the coefficients in that kernel, the length scales, that they fit in uh, to the observations that, that uh, you have, okay? So uh, here is basically how a Gaussian process regression looks like. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is the same uh, example that we did in the early lectures, okay? These are the noisy observations, all right? So the idea is if you take the functions evaluated at the corresponding x locations, right? Or any x locations, you get a multivariate Gaussian, okay? Now I give you the noisy observations with these circles, and what you need to do is you need uh, basically to find the predicted distribution at each x, and that comes to be Gaussian. Uh, this is the mean at each location. So if you are here, this will be the mean response, and uh, this here will define plus minus one standard deviation. Okay? So this is very nice, all right? Uh, uh, as an introduction to Gaussian process, of course, it's much more than that, but uh, um, okay. 442, okay. Um, all right. So we actually a proof that uh, the two formulations, if K is defined in terms of basis functions, are the same. Um, uh, the, okay, let's see what else. So this is the proof I told you that uh, we basically get the old results back. Um, the, uh, I can give you bad news, right? For everything good, there is bad news. Um, one bad news is that uh, uh, everybody in my group that has tried to uh, use for, for things that uh, of interest, they always declare that nothing works. So that's bullet one. Uh, bullet two basically says if you have large training data sets, uh, uh, you need to do special things to make this to work. Uh, okay, so nothing comes basically. There's no free lunch, remember? in uh, uh, the classical theory of computer science. Um, uh, what uh, I can tell you right now is uh, regression is one of the problems where you can use Gaussian processes, but also you can use Gaussian processes uh, for doing model reduction, right? Uh, so we already talked about kernel PCA, another way to actually do nonlinear model reduction of high dimensional data is uh, uh, using a latent variable representation based on uh, Gaussian processes. So there's a lot of uh, research activity of interest there. Um, and let me finish this, uh, we have two minutes. You may ask, uh, how do I compute all the unknown parameters in the kernel? You don't want to go and guess them, right? Because that will make a significant difference in the type of calculations you do. The only thing you can do is, to take the uh, low likelihood, right, and it's written here explicitly, remember it was a Gaussian with covariance CN, and effectively all the unknown parameters of this problem are contained in this low likelihood, so you have to find the derivatives of this uh, and set the parameters to the, uh, to the uh, parameters theta that uh, maximize basically this log likelihood, okay? 
Uh, so I actually give you these calculations for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for I think Gaussian kernels, and uh, uh, you can actually you can become a little bit Bayesian if you don't want to just maximize the log likelihood. You can add the prior term there, all right? So that doesn't really uh, affect very much the calculations. And uh, um, uh, and let me finish with the final thing. Right? I have exactly less than a minute. Uh, if you have a high dimension problem, and in this case, you know, let's say uh, I have a two-dimensional problem, and uh, if you are fitting the Gaussian process in two dimensions, and you may ask, uh, is every dimension important when I try to do predictions? So this is my Gaussian kernel, but you notice I plug in this coefficient theta there, but uh, I'm going to be used to do all this determination. They are going to compute if uh, and what by dimension in my kernel is important or not. So if, for example, if one is zero or close to zero, you know, H1 doesn't uh, affect uh, the variability that I observe my data, um, and it's only the second direction. So how do you do this? You can uh, optimize the log likelihood with respect to these parameters, right? And then you can figure out uh, which of those parameters are important. And I have a little example uh, uh, that shows, for example, this in two dimensions. You notice in, in, um, in this direction, practically very little things change, right? So when you move in this direction, but when you go in that direction, the variability is significant. And you notice when you fit this to data, eta 1 comes to be significant, eta 2 comes to be much less. And there's a nice example that Bishop's book has uh, that took a lot of effort for uh, us to find uh, the correct data to run it, but uh, if you basically couple 